It's uh, my honor and pleasure to introduce a man who, in the history of investigative journalism, has become a legend, Mr. Carl Bernstein, uh, in 1972, together with his colleague Bob Woodward of the Washington Post, uh, and backed by publisher Catherine Graham, editor uh, Ben Bradley. They broke the Watergate stro uh, story, which uh, brought the downfall of uh, President Nixon, both won the Pulitzer Prize for it, and uh, in the film, All the President's Men, you got Dustin Hoffman, and he got uh, Bob Woodward. I think you, it's a good choice. Uh, Mr. Bernstein, in 1976, moved to ABC, contributed to many newspapers and magazines, and uh, now he's with CNN, and uh, he will speak about press freedom from Nixon to Trump, and then we'll open up for Q&A. Mr. Bernstein, please. Thank you. It's good to be back in Israel. And you've certainly chosen the most relevant of topics for this conference because there's no question that in the democracies, especially the democracies of the West and the former communist East, the press is under a kind of pressure, under a kind of effort to undermine our credibility and our effectiveness, and it also, we contribute to undermining our own credibility and effectiveness. So I'd like to weave a little bit of, of what I've heard here into, into my remarks, and then we'll have a discussion back and forth. And I'd like to make this a little personal as well, because I think in talking about my own experience, perhaps some of what this conference is about can come to the fore if we get back to some of the basics that, that we've been talking about in the last few minutes. When I was 16 years old and in my junior year in high school, I went to work almost full time for a great Washington newspaper the Washington Star, the town's afternoon newspaper in those days. The Star no longer exists, but it competed against and in those days usually outreported the Washington Post, where later I spent most of my newspaper career. I really grew up and was educated in that newsroom at the Star by a wonderful group of people, all of them older than I was, by a good number of years, most of them, people who understood what the press, this calling of reporting and journalism, was about and who knew how to have the time of their lives doing what they loved in a collegial environment that teemed with excitement and drama. In 1960, when I went to the newspaper as a copy boy, John Kennedy was running for president, and I was lucky enough to attend most of his press conferences over the next three years, not as a reporter, but to dictate a running text back to the newsroom as Kennedy talked in full, elegant sentences with wit and spontaneity and care for words and learning. And imagine the contrast with today, if you will, for a moment. And whatever Kennedy's failings, he instilled a sense of common purpose and promise to Americans of all backgrounds and economic means. But there's no question that the press, in its real failure to use the techniques and methodology of investigative reporting during the Kennedy administration, left us with a distressingly incomplete picture of the man and his presidency, and that's instructive. Since then, it's been my privilege and good luck to report and write about each succeeding President of the United States, to write books about them, to write a biography of a remarkable Pope, Pope John Paul II, 
to write a biography about the complicated woman who almost became president in 2016, Hillary Clinton. And for more than 40 years now to travel around the world, but particularly around the United States, and between the two coasts, between the Atlantic coast and the Pacific coast, to every state and to learn about the magnificent people who are too often forgotten in Washington, both in our politics and our journalism. The greatest lesson that I learned at the Washington Star has been the underpinning of my work since. The idea that two notions inform what we journalists ought to do and which have larger implications, it seems to me, for my country especially, but probably no less for Israel, for the democratic cultures and societies and things that we share. And the first notion is that the press exists for the public good, not just to make money or to entertain or merely to cause controversy. And second, that our primary function as reporters and editors and news providers, whether online or in print or TV or video, is to give our readers and viewers the best obtainable version of the truth because that's what real reporting, including investigative reporting with its commitment of repertorial time and institutional resources, really is. So I'm going to come back a few times this evening to that very basic notion of what it is we ought to do, the best obtainable version of the truth. Because some 56, 57 years after I went into journalism, it's clear that something basic is not working in the United States today, in our journalism there, that our system is straining almost to the breaking point, both in our journalism and in our politics and our larger culture. And some of that strain, I think, is coming from our failure to commit ourselves to the best obtainable version of the truth. The notion of the public good particularly as the underpinning of our politics and our media, has been undermined and overwhelmed in my lifetime, in the United States certainly, by self-interest and careerism, by partisan assertion, by ideological and cultural warfare at the expense of the national interest. And certainly in the United States, one of the things I see throughout the country, and I don't know if it's true here in Israel as well, is a yearning among young people, and this is where what optimism I have about the future comes from, is that the young people seem to have a great desire to move beyond this cultural warfare that my generation and succeeding couple of generations have placed upon theirs as a kind of yoke that has imprisoned them and endangered their futures, not just in terms of a kind of plutocratic reality, which they now face in the United States, which has been the greatest meritocracy in the history of mankind. But in the last 20, 30 years, we've moved more and more toward a plutocratic model. And what we're debating now in uh, 2017 is really whether or not we can mitigate, particularly through our tax structure and particularly through the prerogatives of the wealthy and the connected, these privileges of plutocracy, which make it much more difficult for young people born in the last 20, 25 years to move in our culture the way people of my generation could, the next generation. So we have a real problem that journalism needs to address. And this business of the best obtainable version of the truth is not our priority enough anymore in journalism or as consumers of news and information as citizens. Today and for some time now, the picture of our society in the United States, and I'll leave it for people here in Israel to let me know what they think 
the situation is here, but the situation in the United States in terms of the picture of our society is rendered in our media and politics in America is too often illusionary and delusionary. Disfigured, unreal, out of touch with truth, disconnected from the true context of our lives. It's disfigured, and again in the press particularly, by celebrity, by celebrity worship, by sensationalism, by manufactured controversy that we drive, by denial of our society's real conditions and complications, good and bad, and here I will go to the Israeli example from what I can see, the idea of not looking at our real existing conditions, and especially by a political and social discourse that we, meaning the press and politicians and the people, have allowed to devolve into a cacophony of name calling, ideological warfare, and easy answers to tough questions that substitute for the best obtainable version of the truth. And we, in journalism, are complicit. <coughs> Washington, a great journalist named Leslie Gelb, wrote in his last column for the New York Times in 1993, Washington, he said, and I quote Les Gelb here, is largely indifferent to truth. Truth has been reduced to a conflict of press releases and a conflict of handlers. Truth is judged not by evidence, but by theatrical performance. Maybe that sounds familiar here in Israel. Truth is fear, fear of opinion polls, fear of special interests, fear of judging others for fear of being judged, fear of losing power and prestige. Truth has become the acceptance of untruths, end quote. The truth is often complex. The best obtainable version of the truth is partly about context, and this is perhaps the most egregious example of a single failing of our journalism and media today, I believe, because too much of it, maybe even most of it too often, is utterly without context. Facts by themselves, no matter how accurate those individual facts might be, are not the truth, especially in isol isolation from the big picture. The other day I was asked in an interview why wasn't the press able to knock Donald Trump out of the race? To which I answered, it's not the job of the press to undo any candidate. It's the job of the press to report on the real existing conditions of a culture, a society, a government, a sports event, an election campaign, a candidate, not to bring about the desired result of the reporter or newspaper editor or owner. It's the job of the people to make those decisions hopefully based upon information that has been further developed by great reporting, including great investigative reporting, especially at the level of the presidency in the case of the United States and those who aspire to it. So I would ask, given the presidential campaign that we've just experienced in the United States, why on earth, because that's not what happened in our campaign, why on earth, with all the resources of the TV networks, and I'll talk a little bit here about television and move away from the print press for a minute, but the television networks and cable networks with all of their airtime and the long trail and public record and public life of Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton and all the other candidates, seeking the presidency on the Republican side. Why did we not see, during the primary campaigns in the United States, a single new investigative reporting documentary or even a single biographical documentary on any of the networks about the major candidates before the primary elections were over and the two nominees were chosen? So that during this crucial process of selecting the two people who would run for the presidency in terms of the nominations of the two major parties, what was the television press waiting for? 
And there was some terrific reporting done by some of the traditional print major media organizations, now online as well. But in terms of television, where most people were getting their news, what happened? And let me add here that the amount of free airtime accorded Donald Trump by the cable news networks and nothing approaching the same for the other candidates during the primaries in the United States. The cable networks made a choice to cover the circus instead of the more plotting aspects of campaign substance. What happened? This, this is a failure of basic journalistic responsibility. So we experienced in our presidential campaign a real failure of the best obtainable version of the truth, whatever those documentaries that weren't done might have shown. And in substitution, we had the circus. We had plenty of talking heads, including my own, analyzing what the candidates were saying, but not the basic reporting. And let me tell you, having done a biography of Hillary Clinton, and having known a lot about Donald Trump over the years. The idea that most people in the United States or that the press had a real in-depth notion of who these two candidates were and reported on that during the campaign and the primaries especially simply was not the case. And now we get to the problem that may be greater and is also related to what I'm describing here than the failure of our journalism. And that is the failure and disinterest of so many of our people and our culture at large in looking for the best obtainable version of the truth, in opening their minds to the best obtainable version of the truth. And I would be surprised from what little I know about Israel, that the situation is much different here. Because increasingly, I'd say, and dominantly in terms of political information in the United States, people are looking for information to reinforce what they already believe, rather than being open to the best obtainable version of the truth. They want information that will buttress the ideological, religious, political and cultural values and prejudices that they already hold. There's no metric that I can measure this by, but I have no doubt that the situation is radically different in this regard about the openness of people to the best obtainable version of the truth at the time of Watergate and today. Despite the failure that I've described here, we have seen online and in print from the traditional great reporting organizations like the Washington Post, the New York Times, and the Wall Street Journal, we finally started to see in the Trump presidency and during the campaign, after there were two nominees, the kind of reporting that should have been done months earlier. But make no mistake, we had a great repertorial failure in this election cycle in the United States, particularly on television, which did this great presentation, as I said, of covering the debates and the talking heads, including my own, but not the real reporting. So now, the big story, in part, is what it should have been back then. Who is Donald Trump? Because now we're learning and reporting about who Donald Trump is in a way that we should have been doing during the campaign. And what do we know about who Donald Trump is, including what we know now about his view of the press that there's been some allusion to here? His view of the press as the enemy of the people, as the creator, supposedly, of fake news, which certainly it is not in terms of the mainstream press, especially it is not in regard to the news as has been reported about Donald Trump in which he regards as fake news, anything but. But we also have a president of the United States who has talked about a constitutional amendment to inhibit the reporting 
that we do in terms of the best obtainable version of the truth, to change our libel laws so that more people and in institutions can sue the press to inhibit reporting, to keep from being covered, to keep the best obtainable version of the truth from being pursued. But also, when we look at Donald Trump, we also need to consider, and are in our reporting now, some basic things that are deeply disturbing. First of all, his lying on a scale such as we've never seen by a president of the United States, whether it's compulsive, uh, whatever adjective we do, want to attach to his lying, the level of untruth that we have seen since January 20th is incomparable in our modern history from a president of the United States. This is not a matter of opinion. This is repertorial, best obtainable version of the truth, which we need to be reporting and are attempting to, and I think the press is doing a pretty good job of it. A level of ignorance about the history of his own country that the President of the United States has demonstrated, about the Constitution of the United States, about real existing conditions in the United States in which the people of the country live. A kind of laziness about not doing the hard work necessary to be a great leader or a real leader. And, and one of the things during the primaries that, that I attempted to find out, uh, I called about half a dozen of the top producers of The Apprentice. Right below the top producer who had created the show, but these half dozen other people all disdained Donald Trump, all said the same thing about him, first of all in terms of his interaction with people who produced the shows, who he treated with disdain, bullied, was dismissive of, but the real problem they had was he didn't do his work. He showed up on the set unprepared. They'd have to repeatedly take him through what he was supposed to do that the basic dynamic of that show that you see on, uh, on television, he didn't do the work for, and we're now seeing the same kind of lack of regard for knowledge, preparation, learning. We are now seeing in the President of the United States, and it's a hell of a lot more dangerous in the President of the United States than somebody getting up on one of the networks and saying, you're fired. And then we have a level of ethical blindness, conflicts of interest of a kind we have never seen in the presidency of the United States in the modern era, certainly. I urge you to go look at the stories of the past week about the Kushner family in China. How many of you all have read about these stories? Please go look at these stories. The idea of a president of the United States, had Hillary Clinton been elected president of the United States, and there are plenty of reasons of her own making that she was not elected president of the United States, but had she been elected and had the kind of conflicts of interest such as the Trump family now has and the president of the United States now has, there would be, I guarantee you, investigations by the Congress of the United States that would be so intense, so fierce, and the outcry, including among people of her own party, would be such that there would be a huge, huge reaction that would ensure that these conflicts of interest were investigated appropriately, which they have not been and do not seem to be in the offing in terms of the presidency of Donald Trump because of the willingness of the Republican majorities in the House and the Senate to ignore this because they see Trump as a way of enacting their agenda rather than see the President of the United States 
as someone who needs to be held accountable to the law. Then there is the question of Donald Trump, his relationship to Russia, Russians, ethno-Russians, the former satellite countries of the USSR that surround Russia. And we're starting to learn more about that. We don't know where this story is going to go, but in terms of the best obtainable version of the truth, and especially whether there was collusion between people in the Trump campaign, people in the Trump organization, people close to Donald Trump, we're beginning to get indications that we need to know a lot more and that the press has been aggressive, has been responsible. He calls it fake news. I call it the best obtainable version of the truth. And I think that we can take some real satisfaction at the kind of job that so many journalistic institutions, especially the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, CNN, the AP, others have been doing in this regard. But also, Donald Trump has shown an authoritarian inclination that is foreign to us in terms of precedence at the level of the presidency, a kind of demagoguery that we have seen in America. We saw it in historically in people like Huey Long, a governor in Louisiana. We've seen it among religious leaders like Father Coughlin after around the time of World War II. We saw it in the McCarthy era, but never at the level of the presidency have we seen the kind of demagoguery. And that, too, is part of the best obtainable version of the truth that we need to be looking at in context. But also, it would be a grave mistake to say that Donald Trump in the campaign did not have some penetrating ideas of some real validity, that he didn't wrongly, that, that he wrongly analyzed some of our conditions in the United States, and particularly the hypocrisy of too many of our leaders and the absurdities of excessive political correctness and the lying of some of those he was running against, though his own lying turned out to be a kind of scale, as I say, that, that is unprecedented. But one of the things that he did accomplish was this criticism of the elites in our country, because there's no question that the institutions in the United States that have been the great backbone of our existence, particularly in the 20th century, have begun to fail systemically in the last part of the 20th century and the first part of the 21st century. Public education, infrastructure, a medical care system that costs us twice the percentage of GDP as any civilized country beside the United States and brings most of our citizens half the care at twice the price. So Trump wasn't wrong when he talked about the, the diminution of American greatness, but his prescriptive and methodology as he expressed himself bordered on a kind of authoritarianism and nativism and appeals to bigotry and a Soviet-like cult of personality that, again, was foreign to our experience in the political process and our cultural experience in the United States. Let me talk for a minute about my experience here in Israel, which has profoundly affected me in this trip as a reporter and as a Jew. Uh, I should say I, I'm a former, as a teenager, I was a regional president of B'nai B'rith Youth. And, and I then became, I, was, I wanted to be the international president. Uh, I ran for it, didn't succeed, and was made the honorary international president <laughs> of B'nai B'rith Youth when I was 17 years old. But 
so I bring that experience as well as my experience as a reporter. And I haven't been here since 1982 when I arrived in Israel on the second day of the war in Lebanon. And on that trip, I soon reported for ABC News, which you had made a reference to, that Ariel Sharon and Menachem Begin had lied to the Israeli cabinet about the purpose of that invasion, that it had not been merely, as they said, to create a 25-kilometer security zone to the north, but rather to push the Palestinian, <coughs> the Palestine Liberation Organization into Beirut and beyond. And after reporting that story, and I went up to Beirut, but the report that I did had some real effect, I think, in terms of what the Israeli press also started to report about Begin and Sharon's skirting of the truth about the invasion in Lebanon. I then spent several more weeks in Israel that year on two trips to participate in seminars here on the war and its aftermath including the massacres in the PLO camps at Sabra and Shatila, and with much of the discussion surrounding the Israeli government's asser assertions of its prerogatives in greater Judea and Samaria as expressed particularly through the expansion of settlement building, then in a more infant phase than we've seen now. And in the interim, between those two trips, in 1982 and now, I wrote a biography about a great pope, John Paul II, about how he and Ronald Reagan collaborated secretly to keep the solidarity movement alive in Poland after the imposition of martial law there, and how this collaboration was one of the great secrets that led to the collapse of communism, how Poland was central to the collapse of communism, so this notion of spiritual and religious power as a source of geopolitical consequence, I was able to see in writing about John Paul II was one of the great stories of our time. But it wasn't until I arrived here a few days ago and began to comprehend the transformation of the state of Israel since I'd last been here it had not occurred to me, and this is my own failure as a reporter, that I had missed probably the most important story since the fall of communism, really the most consequential story of the last years of the 20th century and of the new millennium, I believe. And I've read assiduously the news coverage of, and books on the subject. I can't tell you how many books and how closely I followed the news coverage about what was happening inside Israel and about the intifadas and about the occupation. But until being here, until going into the territories and to Ramallah and experiencing and watching what I can now see has been the demographic transformation in Israel itself, especially in Jerusalem, among the Jews of Israel and the political and cultural consequences and upheaval of those changes, I haven't been able to comprehend how much I missed. And I wouldn't pretend that my knowledge is anything resembling comprehensive. But I do believe after this short time here that any serious reporter who wants to understand our world, including what is going on in Washington and in Europe and what's happening in regard to terrorism and Syria and ISIS <laughs> and everything relating to the internal and external upheavals in the Islamic world, so much bears connection and serious relationship to what has happened here in Jerusalem and throughout this country and the decisions made by the Jews of Israel and their governments and by the neighbors of Israel. But this is the epicenter. And my own failure to recognize that by not being here to cover this story is something that, that will profound me, profoundly affect me for a long time because I now do not understand how anyone who covers the White House, how anyone who seriously wants to be an anchor person in the United States or Britain or in Western Europe or in Eastern Europe can do so responsibly without coming here. It is impossible. 
until there is a better understanding of what emanates from here and within a hundred mile radius of here. I don't think there is a way that we can be truly responsible reporters with a comprehension of the best obtainable version of the truth without understanding what is going on in this country. So I would say to any reporter who aspires to report from Washington and the other great capitals or from anywhere in the Islamic world that he or she must come here and see the occupied territories, understand the pulse of underlying events, understanding the forces that disproportionately, as I say, emanate from this place and have radiated incalculably from this epicenter and will continue to do so. I don't know what the best obtainable version of the truth is because I haven't been here enough. But I do know that this is ground zero of today's geopolitics. That is what I have learned since I'm here. And that it is essential that reporters from all over the world come to this country, look at what is happening in this country, demographically, governmentally, socially, culturally, to understand what is happening outside of this city and radiating around the globe. Because I think there is a disconnect in journalism that has only now become so apparent to me and that we all need to begin to understand. Let me say a word about my own experience about the best obtainable version of the truth, which as I say, I learned as a teenager from great reporters at the Washington Star. There was no Twitter, no internet, just common sense and inquiring minds and a willingness to work long hours and ask hard questions without close, cozying up too close to sources. And then when I was 28 years old, in 1972, with about a dozen years of working for newspapers, I was the chief Virginia correspondent of the Washington Post. I had covered most local events in the city of Washington. I now had this kind of dream job where I covered the legislature in Virginia, this wonderful state, and I traveled around doing feature stories. And I, the day, uh, June 17th, 1972, I was writing a, a political profile about a man, great politician, running for a progressive in a southern state running for the governorship of Virginia. And in the newsroom while I was writing this profile on this Saturday, there was a great commotion around the city desk about a break-in the previous night at the headquarters of the Democratic National Party at the Watergate office building. And another local reporter, Bob Woodward, had been sent to the courthouse to cover the arraignment of five burglars who had been arrested wearing business suits and rubber gloves. That looked like a hell of a lot better story to me than the profile that I was writing of the candidate for governor of Virginia. So I volunteered to the city editor to start making calls. Uh, I was known as somebody who was pretty good at getting information on the telephone. I got on the phone and the city editor shrugged his acceptance. And how many people here have seen the movie of all the president's men or, or read the book? Because or Spotlight, that's an, another great movie that I, I urge you all to see because in either instance, you see the basic methodology of investigative reporting and why it works and why we need it. The great thing to me about the movie of all the president's men is not, is that it, it's not about Bob and myself and our personal lives or what we're like uh, in, in terms of uh, socially or the women in our lives or anything of the kind. It's really about the hard work, basic slogging you do as a reporter if you believe in this idea of the best obtainable version of the truth. And shortly after Richard Nixon resigned the presidency, Bob and I were asked a long question about reporting and we came up in answering it with this short phrase that we've used so many times since to describe our reporting on Watergate and its purpose and methodology that I have tried to emphasize here today, the best obtainable version of the truth. Because it's a simple concept, yet something very difficult to get right. 
because, and I think people here who are journalists know this, of the enormous amount of effort, thinking, persistence, pushback, removal of ideological baggage, and for sure luck that is required, not to mention some unusual in our profession, humility. Underlying everything reporters do in pursuit of the best obtainable version of the truth, whatever our beat or assignment, is the question, and I'll come back to Israel here as well, what is news? What do we as journalists, as reporters believe is important, relevant, hidden perhaps, or even in plain sight and ignored by conventional journalistic wisdom or governmental wisdom? So I'd say that this question of what is news becomes even more relevant and essential if we're covering the President of the United States or the future of Israel. Richard Nixon tried to make the conduct of the press the issue in Watergate instead of the conduct of the President and his men. Woodward and I tried to avoid the noise and let the reporting speak. And during our coverage of Watergate and since, Bob and I learned a lot about the business of reporting from each other. And the other night we had the privilege of talking at the White House Correspondents Association dinner that for the first time the President of the United States did not attend in more than 50 years. And I listed some of the primary elements of Bernstein's repertorial education from Woodward. He very kindly listed a few things he said he'd learned from me, but, but there is a kind of confluence here that I don't know which one begins with each of us, and, and, but almost inevitably, and first of all, we both emphasize this, unreasonable government secrecy is the enemy of the best obtainable version of the truth. And usually, unreasonable government secrecy is the giveaway about where the real story might be. And when lying is combined with secrecy, there's usually a pretty good road map in front of you. Yes, follow the money, but also follow the lying. Second, sources are human beings whom we need to listen to and empathize with and understand and not objectify simply as the means to get a story. We need to go back to our sources time and again, over and over. The best obtainable version of the truth is about context and nuance, as I said, even more than it's about simple existential facts. And as an example of this need to look at sources as human beings, look at the development and help of Deep Throat, Mark Felt, the deputy director of the FBI and Watergate, as a source. This was a deeply human enterprise. And when we were working on our second book about Richard Nixon, The Final Days, Woodward did, for instance, 17 interviews with Nixon's White House lawyer. The point being that sustained inquiry is essential. Not just once, go back over and over and over. You never know the real story until you've done the reporting. Exhaustively gone back to the sources, asked ourselves and asked those sources, what's missing? What's the further explanation? What are the details? What do our sources think the story means? Our assumption of the big picture is not enough. Our preconceived notions, pardon me? Our preconceived notions of where the story might go are almost always different than where the story comes out when we've done the reporting. I know of no important story I've worked on in more than half a century that ended up where I thought it would go when I started on it. The people with the information we want shouldn't be pigeonholed or prejudged by their ideology or politics. Almost all our sources in Watergate were people who had at one time or another been committed to Richard Nixon and his presidency, even up to the end. So we're reporters. We're not judges. We're not legislators. What the government or citizens or judges do with the information we've developed is not part of our process nor our objective. Our job is to put the best obtainable version of the truth out there, period. Ben Bradley, the great editor of the Washington Post, gave a speech 
1993, in which he talked about the aggressiveness of the reporting that we did in Watergate. And as he said in that speech more than 20 years ago, and I quote Ben Bradley, the more aggressive our search for the truth, the more some people are offended by the, tr by the press. So be it. I take great strength, Ben said, knowing that in my experience the truth does emerge. It takes forever sometimes, but it does emerge. And that any relaxation, back to this theme, any relaxation by the press will be extremely costly to democracy. I believe extremely costly in America, extremely costly in Israel. Thank you for having me here. Tom, Tom. Thank you. Have a glass of water. Thank you. You earned it. That was long. Okay. Thanks for sitting through that. Okay, let's open up questions. Yes, please, over there. Please identify yourself. My name is Chaim Shimi. I am a member of the Jerusalem Association of Journalists. Thank you for being here and for your lecture. Um, I was active in the union all my years in journalism because I felt that the sense of job security is vital to obtain the best version of the truth. And I keep asking myself, can we make a difference if we unite and work together or it's all up to the ownership, the money man? From your experience, sir, can we make a difference if we unite work as a union and really give some sense of security to that, to that reporter who keeps hammering, keeps coming to the story? Thank, Thank you. you. Um, I was an officer of the newspaper guild of the union uh, when I was a young reporter. Uh, I think all of the solidarity that we can achieve together as reporters is a great thing, particularly in terms of principles about reporting that go beyond economic ones that have to do with our independence uh, as reporters and making sure that the management does not interfere with the, gr with the best obtainable version of the truth. In terms of, of economic issues, uh, look, the, the profession of journalism <laughs> Uh, we're looking for economic models, particularly in the United States, uh, with the decline of print and print ad advertising. We're looking for new economic models. Uh, and I think I don't know enough about Israel. Uh, in terms of uh, the union movement here, I know that in the United States, less than 8% of the workforce in the United States belong to unions today. Uh, so that the idea of unions as a great force in almost any industry uh, is, a th is a thing of the past. I wish it were not the case. Uh, beyond that, I, I, you know, I really can't answer, answer your question. David. Um, hi, Mr. Bernstein. My name is David Horowitz. I'm the editor of an hi, online David. website called The Times of Israel, and I'm sure you've heard this countless times over the decades, but I certainly went into journalism because of all the presidents, man. I was an impressionable uh, young teen in London. I saw the movie, I read the book, and, uh, and it's why I, I went and, and did what I've done ever since. So thank you for that. Um, I'm really struck and, and frankly baffled, so just if you could elaborate a little bit. You, you're talking about Israel as the epicenter of basically everything that's happening. Now, th there's been a great um, desire in Israel, I think quite credibly, to assert that the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, which was always played up as the root of all problems in the Middle East, is not, and that the Arab Spring kind of proved that. And I don't know if that's what you were suggesting. Why is it, really, that you've, you've concluded that this is the epicenter, and if you want to understand the world, basically, you have to be here? I, th I, I think the following, that you cannot separate what happens in the conflict between the Palestinians and Israel, and the cultural changes in Israel itself that have affected the political policies, cultural realities that have determined some of Israel's policies, that, that 
looking at the world as an interrelated whole, looking, and I'm not suggesting for a second that we forget uh, who's in the neighborhood, that we forget that terrorism has its roots in ideology at times, that all I'm trying to suggest is that to look at what is happening in the world today in terms of <clears throat> the Islamic world and its interaction with the rest of the world as well as internally in the, in the Islamic world and including the excuse sometimes given by many in the Islamic world for indefensible actions and policies. That almost always there are assertions and connections to be made with this place as the epicenter. Is that, is that? It is, it is. No, 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 I, I, I wanna ask David, I, 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 just a second. Uh, I'm, I, I don't usually do a back and forth, I don't usually do a back and forth like this. But, but again, I'm talking about our trying to get to the best obtainable version of the truth, which is a very complicated process. And what I'm suggesting is that too many of us who are reporters have not looked or come to this place as understanding how much emanates from here. Okay. Uh, by the way, if you want to start a second career here, Jerusalem Press Club is a good place. Uh, yes, please. Short question, please. Sure. Arik Bacha, formerly of Reuters and others, what is your estimate of the likelihood of an impeachment over the next four years? Thank you. Uh, the great thing ab about being a, a reporter is I don't have a crystal ball. And, uh, and I, I mean, I, I really don't know. I, uh, we have to see what facts are developed by the press. We have to see what, what, what the best obtainable version of the truth is in terms of what we do, uh, what emerges from con congressional investigations, what kind of will, uh, but, but also, and, and there are many areas to be considered. Trump's <laughs> conflicts of interest, Will they be considered? Uh, probably not. In whatever the case, it, you take a crystal ball. I don't have one. Not what I what I do. If it happens, it started here. But you remember, that. <laughs> Ilana. Uh, Mr. Bernstein, my name is Ilana Dayan. I'm an investigative reporter, working for Channel Two here in Israel. And and given all the other undercurrents that you've described and that we wrestle with them here, be it the attempts by the government to inhibit free press and suppress it and beat sensationalism and economic pressures. I have the feeling that more often than not it depends on us, our ethos, our commitment to the best obtainable version of the truth. And I'd like to draw on your experience because we all know there's a moment. There's a moment where you have, the, you have the story, you know the risks, you know the danger, you know the pressures, and you decide to go ahead with it. Was there such a defining moment for you? Um, first of all, I don't want to underestimate how exciting working on that story was. And I think that all of us who are reporters understand the excitement of doing a, a great, being on a great story. Um, that there is a moment that, uh, that is seminal, I think, as follows, but, but it doesn't quite answer your question in the way you ask, but I think it's as close as I can get. About 10 weeks after the break-in at the Watergate, uh, we had determined through our reporting methodology of going to people who worked for President Nixon and his reelection committee that we had discovered there had been a secret fund controlled by five people, including uh, the president's campaign manager, who was the former attorney general of the United States, and that that secret fund had paid for the bugging at Watergate, 
And we were about to write that story. Ben Bradley came to us and said, you know, you're about to call the Attorney General of the United States a crook. There's never been a story like this before. Uh, and Woodward and I would meet in the vending machine room to have coffee together every morning to get our ducks in the row to make a presentation to the editors, kind of good cop, bad cop routine we had. I was not the good cop. <laughs> and, uh, and I put a dime in the coffee machine which is what coffee cost then. And I literally felt the hair, like I felt a chill go down my neck, literally, only time in my life. And I said to Woodward, oh my God, this president is gonna be impeached. And Woodward said to me, oh my God, you're right. <laughs> and we can never use that phrase around the Washington Post because our editors or somebody else might think we have an agenda. And we never did. And this was almost two years before impeachment really took hold. Um, so that's the moment. Uh, and um, beyond that, I, re I, I really can't, can't answer you. But, but again, it was true that our job was to get the information, put it out there, and whatever the system did with it, and the system worked magnificently in Watergate, the judiciary, the Congress of the United States, uh, and, uh, and the press. But wasn't there a moment that you were afraid that Bradley was about to take? No, there was no, one of the things that, that absolutely not. Uh, I might have disagreed with the uh, uh, editing decision that Bradley say you didn't have this story, you need a little more information on that. and it, only later did Woodward and I understand how heroic Ben Bradley and Catherine Graham were in Watergate. A uh, quick example uh, of it, and back to something that, that was referred to uh, by Ms. Svetlova. Uh, a subpoena server came with papers to serve on Woodward and me about 10 weeks after the break-in as part of a suit that the President's Re-Election Committee had filed to try and get to our sources. And uh, I got a call from the guard downstairs at the building saying there's somebody here with a subpoena for your notes. I said, don't let him in the building. I called Ben Bradley, uh, said there's this guy downstairs wants our notes. Uh, he's got a subpoena for them. What do we do? Uh, Bradley said, just a minute. I'll get right back to you. He called Catherine Graham, talked to Catherine, the publisher of the Washington Post. Bradley called me back, and he said, okay, two things. Get out of the building right away, and they're not your notes. Catherine says they're her notes, and if anybody is going to go to jail, it's going to be Catherine Graham. So that is the answer to your question. Okay. Yes. Noam, please. Hello, welcome to Israel. I'm Noam. And I blame you when we talked on the phone that I, I almost even finished my doctorate because of you, because I was just glued to the television during all the Watergate hearings. <laughs> so I'm very, very glad to, to see you here in Israel. My question to you, uh, you said that in the short visit here in Israel, you have learned a hell of a lot of, uh, that you did, that you, were so, you were surprised. You haven't been here since 1982. And your visit here enlightened you in a way that shocked you in a way. What did you see that you could not see from a distance? Thank you. I, it, it's, it's once again, uh, what, you can never cover a story without going there. And what, what I saw is not so much in terms of an individual factoid or what I see and saw is that what is happening here that I don't believe, as a reporter, that we in the United States or elsewhere in the world quite understand how much effect it has had and is having on the things that we cover. That, so that, to, that there are certain things that if you are going to report, you need to know 
are in your wheelhouse, horizon, however you want to put it. And simply reading about what has happened here and what has happened in the territories and reading about the transformation of Israeli society, the demographic changes, is not sufficient to being here. And what I'm suggesting is that, that we don't have enough experience among our great reporters who have spent enough time here. And I'm saying I believe it's necessary for them, and not just here, but people from Paris and people from London and people all over, uh, to come here and do some firsthand reporting and observation. Well, That's wrapping it. up, yes, I please. Mean, uh, I was going to ask, sir, are there any students here that want to ask any questions? That I just want to... Over there. there. There's a student up there, yes. Hold on one second. Give him the mic, you'll get it back. Uh, Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Jacob Friens. Uh, I'm a student at the University of British Columbia, and I study international relations. And I was once told that I should study and gain experience in something other than journalism and use that expertise to be a journalist. Would you agree? I said, tell me the last part there. Um, to use the expertise that I would gain in another study than journalism to be a journalist eventually. Um, I should answer this question as a college dropout, uh, <laughs> which, which I am. Um, I think that uh, the best thing you can do as a journalist is to get a job and learn on the, on the job. That, that really the best preparation uh, for being a reporter uh, is having a body of knowledge, whether it comes from your reading in an academic institution and in your study or, or whether you do it on your own. But the more knowledge you have of, uh, and also about writing, and uh, of um, a liberal education, that would, that would be my answer. Very good. To Eva. that. Um, my name is Eva Ilouz, and I'm not a journalist. Um, you, in your fascinating talk, you started it by a sentence saying, um, it used to be the case that citizens wanted to know the truth um, and they were fighting against government and against government secrecy um, to know the truth. And now you have to fight, actually the, the media uh, journalists have to fight with the audience for them to want to know the truth. I find this sentence mind-boggling. I was trying to think during your talk about why that might be the case. And I, I'll just be very, very uh, short, I hope. Please do. Uh, so, so one thing it seems to me is that the model of truth... I'm, I'm going to ask you to ask the question. Tell me what yeah, the yeah. question is. Yeah, uh, this is, this okay. is coming. She's getting yeah. there. <laughs> Go ahead. Thank you. I'm an academic, so I need to preface She's my also questions. French. You know the French. And I'm French, too, mm -hmm. to which is a bad combination. No, <laughs> so, um, so my first question is, you have a model of truth, I think, as something that happened or did not happen. Was there a criminal break in or not? But I think quite often today, uh, the question of truth is paused differently. I, I'm going to ask you to ask the question, please. It's, it's a question, I'm sorry to say. It is a question. Well, ask, go ahead. So, Put a question. So, so, you know. so, so the question, uh, quite often people think of truth as dividing two people. Two people have their own version of something that happened, right. and in that case, it's quite difficult to know whose truth you should represent. Just let me finish. Second, in France, I'm very familiar with the Jewish community of France, people will tell you that French, the, the French media are anti-Zionist because when they present a terrorist uh, attack in Israel, for example, they would explain the context of the terrorist attack. 
and or when, for example, they, I, I'm gonna you know. I'm going to ask you again that we yeah. please get to the question. Yeah, you it, have to be no. patient, and I'm getting <laughs> there. <laughs> just, no, I, I'm, I'm, I'm and then my, you, I'm just I'm saying, in I'm this <laughs> case, there is a context. The, the act is presented as a context, and people resent. The Jewish, many of the Jewish community, resent the contextualization of a terrorist attack in Israel. They resent it because they say this is a way to diminish of the horror of the attack. And finally, to go back to Trump, a lot of critiques. No, no, I'm, I'm going I'm to cut you off. One at a time. Excuse me. Please. I'm going to cut you off, so and I'm going to try and you. answer okay. what, I think, what I think you're getting towards. Okay. You'll permit me. First of all, one person's truth and another person's truth. What I'm suggesting about the best obtainable version of the truth is, it's not about that one person or the other person. It's that you have a responsibility as a reporter to go to one source after another, after another, after another, after another, after another to look at the whole situation, to find out about what you're reporting by going to find sources who know what is occurring, what has occurred. And that through that, you get to the opportunity to have the best obtainable, best obtainable version of the truth. It's a methodology, it's a purpose, and it comes together in the action of doing the reporting. Uh, as for the explanation of why people in the French community, uh, the French Jewish community might see uh, questions of terrorism one way or another, I, I'm not qualified to answer that question. Uh, and as for Trump, if you have a specific question about Trump, uh, well, yeah, that would have been here. That, that, so, here, but, here, but here, we'll here. go on to the next question. We have Thank a you. question here, yes. Two last questions, one, two. Okay. I'm Patricia Kranz from the Overseas Press Club in New York, and my question is, at the beginning you said um, that, the net, that the television didn't do um, in-depth reporting on Clinton or Trump before the, the, the candidates were chosen. What did, what do you, what do you know about Hillary Clinton that did not come out that the rest of Thank us you. don't know? I think, I, I, again, again, read the book, that's the first thing. <laughs> it's called A Woman in Charge. But, but that book was written by the book. I, I think what I'm saying is we should have done the reporting. It's not about what I know. We should have done the reporting and we didn't. Next question. Yes. Last one. I'm, I'm Greer Cashman from the Jerusalem Post. Um, how do you present the best obtainable version of the truth in a soundbite era? Uh, it may be a soundbite era, uh, but there is more space online devoted to news than there was by far in the age of print. So there, the, the internet is a great platform. There's plenty. Look, we have to, we have to resist the pressures of 24/7 news cycle. Uh, and and I, for instance, most good reporting I think is done not when the city editor or the national editor sends you out on X, Y, or Z assignment to cover the legislature. Uh, yeah, you got to go to the hearing about the education committee. You got to do what's perfectly reasonable that the editor expects you to do. When I cover the Virginia legislature, I do five stories that I file between 5 and 7 p.m. And then at 7 o'clock, I'd go out and look for the stories that I thought were really important by talking to sources, having dinner with them, finding out what was really going on. I do not believe that real news institutions turn down good stories. I think that there's plenty of opportunity to get them up there online, plenty of opportunity to get them in print, plenty of opportunity to get them on the air, that we need to do the work. Carl, thank you very much. Thank you.